So good morning. If you are not at last week's session, I'm Jessica Philippe from the South Central Regional Library Council. I'd like to welcome you to part two of the communications workshops. Today we're going to be focusing on being understood or outgoing communications. If you would like a certificate of attendance for today, please type your email into the chat box. And we are recording today's presentation except for the breakout sessions and I will send you a link to the recording in the slides. And I will just quickly introduce Jill Hurst Wall for those of you who weren't here last week. So Jill is a consultant, speaker, writer, and educator, and now Professor Emerita in Syracuse University's iSchool. So welcome back, Jill. Thank you. Thank you. Let me um, share my screen. Okay. So uh, a little bit of housekeeping. Um, there is a chat and uh, Jessica is going to be watching the chat and seeing what questions pop up. So if you have questions uh, as we're going through this, please put them in chat. I'll stop periodically and see, ask if there's any questions that people want to talk about. I'm going to ask you to keep your camera off and keep your microphone off. Those two things will help everyone else with bandwidth. And so, you know, I know we have some people calling in. We might have some people who are actually in a car or wherever you might be. And so keeping your camera off and keeping your microphone off really helps with that. When we get to a breakout session, which I hope to do later uh, in this workshop, then you can turn your cameras on and turn on your microphones. So Jessica's already introduced me. One of the things I said last time, and I'll say it again here, is that because I'm a busy person, I've had to be organized. And because I'm a busy person, I've also had to learn how to communicate effectively and how to use my communication tools in a way that works for me and works for the people that I work with. And so uh, last time we talked about um, uh, stemming the tide of communications coming into you. This time we're going to talk about things that you are doing, the things that you're sending out. So these are the two workshop um, descriptions, but I can tell you that the two topics overlap, right? We can't talk about stemming the tide of, of information coming at us without also talking about some of the things that we send out. And today, we're going to talk about being understood, but that also requires talking a little bit about the information that's coming at us. So there's some overlap. You will have access to both recordings. If you were not in part one, do not despair. Do not despair. Um, this really does stand on its own. I may refer back to some things that people heard last week. That's okay. Also a good refresher. So again, use chat to ask questions um, and I'll turn my attention to that through Jessica uh, on a periodic basis. What I do want to ask that you put in the chat also besides questions is anything for those of you who are in part one that you want to share with everyone else. So is there something that stood out to you now a week later from part one that you want to share? Um, a tip, an idea, something you've tried, uh, maybe something you tried and it worked well, something you tried and it worked horribly, whatever it might be, feel free to put that information in chat. Also, so, you know, get your fingers active. Also put in chat um, the pros and cons of how your workplace communicates. So this is a great thing for you to share and to think about and think about maybe more than sharing, but what are the pros and cons of how your workplace communicates? What does your workplace do well in terms of communicating? What does your workplace do not so well or where could it improve? And you might think about this as you know, as you're interacting with the people in your workplace who now may be 
all working from home, um, how is it going for you? you know, when you're trying to communicate with them and be understood by them, what's going well? Or what do you see that maybe needs some changes? And as you think about that and perhaps post something in chat, this will help prime you for the rest of this webinar. So I want to start with talking about your culture, your personal culture. Now, this is important to me because I'm originally from Pennsylvania. And it has not happened in a while, but every once in a while, I'd have someone say to me, oh, that's a term that's used in Pennsylvania. Or someone get annoyed with me because I called soda or pop or whatever the wrong name. Um, I once had a student kind of jump in front of me to defend me and, and yell, she's from Pennsylvania. <laughs> to calm everybody down. Um, so what's your culture? What's your communication culture? How do you use language? Now, language is very regional, very, very regional. So how do you use language? Are there words that you use that people always kind of look at you you know, with a side eye, that, words that they don't understand. They're always commenting that you um, use language different than them. Are there maybe things that you spell differently, words that you use differently, uh, ways that you describe things differently, whatever it might be. How do you use language? What assumptions do you make? This is part of your culture. What assumptions do you make? Do you assume that everyone will reply to your emails? Do you assume that when a person nods yes, that they mean yes? Or do you assume that they're just kind of nodding because as an indication that they hear you? What do others do that make you mad or baffled? So your culture is interacting with other people's communication culture. And what are they doing? You know, what's interfering with your culture, your communication culture? Is it um, that they always respond to emails and you're in, in your communication culture, you don't always respond to emails? Is it um, that they assume questions rather than actually ask questions? And that's one for me and something we'll talk about later. But some people will write an email or sit in front of me and make a statement and assume that they've asked a question. That's their culture. In my culture, I'm looking for a question. So, you know, for me, that's maddening. You know, what was the question? You didn't ask one, but clearly you're sitting there looking for an answer. And what do you do that baffles other people? What do you do in terms of communication, just communication? that baffles other people. Maybe something that you've never explained to them. Maybe you don't even know it's baffling because they haven't told you. So something to think about as you think about your culture, and we'll think about it more, is you know, getting information from your workmates sharing information with your workmates about how you use communication and also how you use language. So this then translates into your work culture. And every workplace has a culture, every workplace. 
Even if you work in a library, a branch library in your system, and you move to another branch library in your system, that culture is going to be different. The people in that new branch library may have been there for years. They've worked together. They know each other. They have grown to share the same language, the same words. You're going to come in. How you use words is going to be different. How you think about communication is going to be different. Um, and so your work culture, even in how you do the work, is going to be different. So our culture for communications includes our methods, our words, our time frame, and our acceptable norms. Something for you to think about is what is acceptable at your workplace in terms of communication. What is acceptable? So let's think about these in, in a little bit of detail. In part one, we talked about methods. The tools that you use to communicate, whether it's text messaging, email, phone calls, face-to-face, -face, Slack, other tools, Zoom, um, lots of different methods. In your workplace, do people understand what communication methods to use and for what? And for what? So if you're using email in your workplace and you're also using Slack, which is a bit like text messaging, um, but be for me, better than text messaging, um, have you decided what to use which for? Does everyone understand the methods to use and when to use them? That might be something that you'll want to figure out, maybe something to talk with other people about. Do you all in your workplace use work-related words the same way? Do they have the same meaning? There are some jobs where when you go to work there, you have to learn a specific language. You have to learn what those tools are called. You have to learn what those, um, whatever it is, is called. So think about being a plumber, right? A plumber uses a certain set of tools. They all have names. And when you're a plumber, you have to understand those tools, what they're used for, and what they're called. I don't know what a spanner wrench is, but I'm sure that a plumber does. And when they ask for a spanner wrench, that's what they want to get. At your workplace, are you all using your work-related words the same way? If you have to stop and translate what that person means, then maybe you're not using your work-related words the same way. Maybe you should come to an agreement. If you're thinking about bringing in new people to your workplace, even temporary people, volunteers, maybe there's some work-related work -related words that you should teach them. Maybe you start with a list. Oh, these are the things that are really meaningful to us. And they have very specific meanings, right? Now, to stay on this for just one more example. I'm going to assume that everyone here has at some point been in a hospital, maybe just as a visitor. And you hear announcements over the loudspeaker system. They might call for Dr. White or Dr. Blue, or Dr. Green. You know, Dr. Green, come to the fourth floor. Well, some of those announcements are actually coded. And everybody who works there knows the code. In fact, I've seen nurses where on the back of their badge, the codes are listed. So they all know that when they hear that specific announcement, what the code is, and they know if they're the ones who should, should respond. So they're using words the same 
way. When are people expected to check whatever those communication tools are? Or to make it personal, when are you expected to check those communication tools? Are you expected to check first thing in the morning as soon as you wake up? Are you expected to check right before you go to bed? Are you expected to check within normal work hours, whatever those might be these days? Um, so when are you expected to check? When are you expected to answer? And really, those are two different things. Last week, someone mentioned, you know, not responding right away if it's at night. Maybe you type the response, but you save it and send it the next morning. So you're not prompting a communication during off hours. So think about that. When? Can you get some agreement on when? That helps other people, but that also helps you. That helps you. That helps you understand what your free time is, what your time away from work is, even if you're working from home. It lessens your anxiety. Um, it can make you happier if you know when you don't have to be communicating with work. And finally, what are the acceptable communication norms? Is informally communicating acceptable all the time? Are there times when you expect something more formal or where your workplace expects something more formal? Is it okay that the communications have typos in them, that they're not perfect? Is that an acceptable norm? Um, is it acceptable for you to uh, turn on an autoresponder that says that you're not available right now? That helps you if you can do that, by the way. If you can say, I'm not available. So what are the acceptable norms? When can you signal that you don't have time to communicate? And what is that signal? Many years ago, I worked in a group that, where we had to do monthly reports. But my boss's rule was that we only did a report if we had accomplished something, finished something. But the group actually did a lot of troubleshooting. So accomplishing something wasn't always what we did. It was just normal. And some months I would run into his office, look at him and say, I did nothing this month and run back out. <laughs> which seems kind of odd, but he understood it, right? I didn't accomplish anything this month. All I did was troubleshoot. And that was acceptable. So what are the acceptable norms for your office? I'm going to do two more slides and then I'm going to check uh, chat. Um, so acceptable norms. Uh, culture. How does someone learn this in your organization? How does someone learn your organization's communication culture? Does it happen during orientation? Does your workplace do an orientation? Maybe given that we haven't been at work for nine months, all physically together, maybe it's time for reorientation, right? Let's reorient ourselves to how we communicate and set ourselves up for being successful for the next X number of months. That might be especially useful if you've brought someone new on board during the last nine months. Does someone learn your communication culture from feedback? Do you go to that person and say, you did this, this didn't exactly work? or you did this, this is how we do it here. I'm, trying, I'm not trying to be critical, I'm just trying to help you understand this culture. Does someone learn it from word of mouth through the grapevine? Is it trial and error? Worse, is it through failure? Does someone fail to communicate, fail to do it right, 
And now, you know, something has happened. Maybe the communication wasn't received. Maybe there was a, a failure in something at work because of it. Yeah. But how does someone learn? Now, think about this and then, you know, through this workshop, you should be making notes. But if there's something that your organization should be doing, maybe a reorientation, make that note. And then we'll think about, you know, what that really means. So in terms of planning for a work team discussion, whether it's a reorientation, whether it's part of a, a staff meeting, whether it's um, a Zoom meeting or some one-on-ones, whatever it might be, you know, make some notes so that you can think about how to be understood. Right? How can they be understood, the people around you be understood, and how can you be understood? So what are our norms? What are our norms about communication? And that could, that's a wide open question. Is it when, is it where, is it how, is it the words, what is it? What are the norms? Make some notes. What's working well? So in terms of how you're communicating, what's working well for you? For you? Are people understanding you? Are you understanding them? So what's working well? Do you have examples of what's worked well where you all this past nine months or maybe even before that have communicated really well? Where could you improve? Is it using a different tool? Is it learning? What is it? And you as a team, but you as a person, right? Where could you improve? Maybe you need to learn something about the tools that your team is using. Maybe you're doing okay with those tools, but if you spent five, 10, 15 minutes learning, you could do even better. What could you do differently? Um, if you're thinking about how you're communicating, how your team is communi communicating, one question is how you, do you get your boss on board? If you are the boss, how do you get your team on board? Um, maybe it's get everyone else on board and then approach the boss and say to your boss, we've been thinking about how we communicate and we think we could do better. This is what we wanna do. And if you were in part one, and I know not everyone was, what do you wanna tell your team from that session? So again, make some notes and you can make notes to the remainder of this session. Uh, some other things to think about is um, if you're gonna have a discussion, if you're gonna prompt that discussion with your teammates, do it in a way that's honest, um, set judgment aside and tell them like, you know, we just need to communicate better or I need to communicate better with you. It's always helpful if you make it I statements. I need to communicate better with you. So I want to talk about how we're communicating. I don't want to judge anyone, um, but can we have an honest discussion about this and see if we can do better? Can we be open for making changes? So try not to be accusatory. Try to set aside judgment and then see where you might be able to prompt some changes or maybe you'll just see that the changes need to be you, not your entire team. So I'm gonna stop sharing for a moment uh, because that will allow me to see chat.
Yeah, no direct questions, but I'm definitely seeing a theme in the chat that you kind of touched on, which is that people are feeling like management really sets the tone for the communications. Those communications don't always trickle down to people. And then kind of what can you do if you're not in management to change the culture? Yeah, and so that is... Um... <laughs> Sorry, I'm laughing at one of the comments. Um, so that's hard. And that's why maybe getting everyone else on board or getting a majority of the people on board can be really helpful. Uh, and then approach everyone else. Or maybe you find the people who are willing to change, you all make the changes. See how it works. See if other people start to adopt the same changes as you. Maybe, you know, through the grapevine. Maybe it's you know, once you're all on board, maybe then you approach everyone else and say, this is what we're doing. This is how we've benefited. And then see if you can get everyone else on board. Um, someone wrote uh, that their boss wants to use email all the time, even if half the staff are not near a computer, the majority of the time. So uh, think about that's a, a wonderful comment. Um, think about for you and the staff, how and when you want to communicate. What makes sense for you? What tools you're using? So do some pre-work um, about what you're doing, why you're doing it that, that way, when you're doing it, why you're not doing email, figure out what you like to do, and then, then approach your boss and say, you know, we've talked about this, this is what would work better and be more timely or be more efficient or be more whatever it might be. And see if you can get your boss on board. It may, it may be a tough sell, tough sell. Um, your boss may be realizing that they're not as efficient as they should be in terms of communication. And maybe you could prompt something that would be better, that would be different. Um, this might be a place where you look at different communication tools and you try to find that thing that will fit. So if people aren't near a computer all the time, Do they have their phones with them? And I know this is crossing a line um, because many people do not like to use their personal phones for work communication. Um, but is there a specific tool on their phone that they could uh, install that would only be for work communications? And would your boss use that tool? So Slack, um, which I, I use in several different teams I'm on uh, is one that there are clearly many others, but you might say, we're gonna use this tool with people install it on their phone, recognizing that you're only gonna use it for work and only you know, during work hours, whatever that might be. Um, and then I just want to scroll back up for one more. So there's a question about partner organizations. Um, and Susan, I will try to remember that one because that's a very good question. Uh, Lisa, also a very good question where people are not all using the same tools for communicating. And so how do you get people um, on board. That's also a very good question. I will try to remember that one too. And Sarah notes uh, that email is not always ideal, but when you have people working different shifts, and this, this is a very good point, email is a great way of getting at them. Um, 
with a consistent message. I would also say that some of the other tools um, are a good way of getting at them. So depends on what you're trying to communicate um, in terms of, of time shifting that communication. Email is great. Email will never go away. But there are other tools that do also work across shifts. And so um, just be aware of that. Okay. So I'm going to go back Where am I? and start sharing my screen again. So first of all, thank you for the comments you're putting in chat. Keep doing that. Um, one of the things that's important about communication is that we talk about how we communicate, that we think about it, and we often don't stop and think about it. And so having this time to think about what's going well, think about how you might alter communication is important. Okay. So last time I talked a bit about email and I'm going to continue to talk about email uh, because it is pervasive. Many years ago, I remember people saying, you know, this will be the end of email. <laughs> and here we are, we're still using email. Um, when you tame email, the same things that you think about doing in email to tame your email, work with other work for other methods too. So keep that in mind. What I'm going to talk about with email, you can translate into the other methods. So if it must be email, use a descriptive subject. Um, the subject is the first, first thing the person sees. If they're on their phone, if they're on their computer, if they are in the email, wherever they are, that subject is going to pop up. That subject line can actually be quite long. Look at the subject line. Look how long it is. So use a descriptive subject. This is the first thing the person's going to see. It's what should make them open the email. So what is this email really about? Can you signal that in the subject line? Is this important? Is this like, read right away? Is this what? So, you know, use it. Use that space that you have. Uh, some things to think about. One, is it important? So sometimes I will put the word important in capital letters at the start of the subject. I don't do this all the time. I do this as really important. Some email systems will allow you to signal importance with some sort of a flag. Many email systems do not allow you to do that. So if you can put something in the subject line that says important or immediate response needed or you know, answer now or whatever those words are that you and your work group agree on. We get dozens of emails every day. Um, and so if this email is a, for a specific project and you all are working on multiple projects, can you put in the subject something that signals what project it is? Maybe it's just the initials, the acronym for the project. That can be really helpful. Because when I open up my email in the morning and I get that list of emails, that pop up on my screen. If something is for a particular project, I want to know that. Maybe the, that's the email I need to read first. So I'm on the board of trustees for my local library system. When I send emails to the board or to other people about the library system, I put OCPL at the start of the email. F four letters and the colon. You know, so you know if you are working someplace else and you're not actually in 
the system itself, you're another board member, you know, you're going to see from me that that's an email about the library system. So use a descriptive subject line. Um, if you're um, receiving, excuse me, if you're answering the email and the subject line is not descriptive, retitle it. Sometimes you'll get an email thread, it's going back and forth and back and forth, and suddenly it's not about the thing that it started. Maybe it was about Sally's retirement party, and now you're talking about hiring temps, right? So retitle that email. And so here's a, an example. Subject, January story times was, you know, this other subject line. So people can see that it used to be something else. It's part of that same thread, but really this is a this has turned into an email thread about January story times. So feel free to retitle emails so that they're, they're better understood. Limit who you're sending emails to. And I still struggle with this sometimes. Because I think, well, that person will want to know, and that person will want to know, and that person will want to know. But no, limit. Who is this email really for? Who is it really for? Remember that you have the two subject line. And in the best possible world, this is the people to who the email is really for. You have that CC. In super old days, this was the carbon copy of the printed memo. Um, these are people who received the carbon copy. So who are you copying in? This isn't really for them, it's for their information. Sadly, that's not what we use CC for anymore. They're just other people. Um, but that might be a norm that you'd want to adopt with your work group. These are people that just need to know about the topic. And then we have BCC, the blind carbon copy. These are people who are receiving a copy, but they're not named, they're not known. Now, we actually use the recipients of two and CC the same. That's become our norm as an email culture. Um, and when you're doing the replies, you know, it gets all messed up. We sometimes use blind carbon copies when we are copying a lot, a lot of people. And so that everyone doesn't see that massive list and it makes the email really long, we put people in the BCC field. That's a great way of um, not junking up people's emails. The other reason to use BCC is if you don't want people to automatically reply to everyone else on the email message. So something to think about there. Um, but limit the recipients. <laughs> limit. Even with all those fields, who really needs to see this email? If you, um, yeah, I'll just stop there. Limit your recipients. Limit your social chattiness in your email. We think that we need to be chatty. Hi, hope you're having a wonderful day. Uh, kind of cloudy out, but the blue sky is peeking through. Yes, this is, you know, month nine of the stay at home orders. And then you get to what you're really writing about. And then you end with, you know, I hope everything's fine with you. Um, looking forward to your reply. Signed, Jill. Limit your social chattiness. Get to the point. Um, 
if you want to be chatty, you know, find a line. Hope you're doing well. Hope you're, you know, whatever. But don't think that you have to be overly chatty. This is email or text messaging or whatever it might be. Um, get to the point. There's actually been years ago a movement, which obviously did not succeed, to get people to limit email messages to five sentences. Five. In other words, get to the point. So get to the point. Yes, you might need to send long emails. That's one of the benefits of email. Um, but get to the point, limit your chattiness. Already said this. Include enough information, right? So include the information you want the people to have that may make your email longer. That's okay. But get to the point. Use subheadings in emails that can help organize your emails, get people to see what you're talking about. Use bolding in your emails that can help people to see, narrow in on what you're talking about. Uh, I'm going to talk a bit later about questions. If you have a long email and buried in there is a question, sometimes it's helpful to bold that question so it stands out. If you're replying to other people's emails, you might want to quote and bring up into your email the important text that you're responding to. That can be very helpful. Don't assume that everyone recognizes what you're responding to. Bring that text up, copy it, and paste it into your email as a quote. Along with that, if you're replying and you've got this long email thread, edit out the information that's not needed. You're helping everyone's inbox when you do that. So go down there, delete what's not needed. If there's something that needs to be kept, keep it. Um, but you don't need to be emailing a thread that now is 10 emails deep. Delete what's not needed. Um, the other thing about forwarding email, which I've talked about a bit, is um, If context is needed, additional context, so maybe you're forwarding to people who are not, don't know what's happening, provide that additional context. If you're forwarding an email and some of the people who are on that email initially need to know that you're forwarding, maybe you copy them in. Maybe that's a place where you can use that blind copy you know, and just say, you know, have blind copied in or copied in, you know, blah, blah, whoever, right? Forward, we can forward lots of emails. It doesn't mean that we should. It doesn't mean that sometimes we do it when people don't expect their emails to be forwarded. And so it can be helpful that they're part of that forwarding, that they know that their email has been forwarded on to someone else. And the last thing, again, not on this slide, um, but do you have a signature file, a signature that goes below your email? Most email systems will do that automatically. They'll put in the signature. What is in your signature? Um, is it who you are? Is it your contact information? Some people have very long signature files. I'm not so much for long signature files, but you know, having that information down there can be helpful. It's not always communicated in that to field or, or your from field, excuse me, who you are. So a signature can be helpful. And something that you might want to put in your signature are your pronouns. 
there's an effort to make pronouns normal, talking about what our pronouns are more normal. And so putting them in your signature, signature file can be helpful. So underneath my name in my signature file, it says she, her, hers. Easy to do. Oops. Ah. Oh. There was one more down there. Make questions obvious. Make questions obvious. Um, I don't like emails where there is an implied question, but not a real question. So I look in emails for a question mark. Did you ask a question? Because now I know what what I'm supposed to be replying to. And when I write emails and I have a question, I make sure there's a question in there with a question mark. So if there's, even if I think the question has been implied, I will still put in maybe a shorter version of the question or a what do you think question mark um, because that question and question mark is a clue to the other person. Here's a question. I'm looking for an answer. So make your questions obvious. That helps you to be understood, helps the other person know why they should be replying or if they should be replying. I said this in part one, um, and I'll say it again, limit your humor in all the tools, right? Limit your humor or make your humor obvious. Jokes in email don't work. Jokes in text messaging don't always work. Jokes in any tool don't always work because we don't recognize them as being a joke. So, Make your humor obvious if you put in humor. You can put in a smiley um, symbol. I will use an uh, angle brackets sometimes with the word grin in the angle brackets. If, if anyone here writes HTML, you know, you'll recognize the angle brackets um, as a way of making the humor obvious. This is also, um, humor is cultural. So people from different cultures, even cultures within the United States, may not recognize your humor. So again, make your humor obvious. Um, but first of all, limit your humor. Humor sometimes relies on body language, you know, the way you hold your head and roll your eyes, and an email and text messaging and whatever text-based tools, they cannot see your body language. Limit emoticons because that makes email less accessible. So, you know, those cute smileys and bottles of champagne or whatever you might use, screen readers probably do not understand them. So limit them. Um, and, and a great way to get people to limit them, your workmates, is to talk about accessibility. Um, you know, we want to be accessible. So let's do things, even in email, that makes us more accessible. And limiting emoticons is one thing you can do. Email often gets used as conversation. It's not a conf conversation tool. The phone is a conversation tool. Um, text messaging or you know, more instant communication tools are better for conversation. But email is not conversational. It's a delayed conversation that often gets misunderstood. 
because someone will jump into conversation 10 hours later and not realize that the conversation has finished, right? So don't use email for conversation. Find another way in your work team to communicate, to have that conversation. Proof before you send, yes, there will be mistakes. Been there, done that. But if you can just proofread once before you send, try to make corrections. Depending on the length of the email, reading it out loud or just mouthing the email as you read it can help you find mistakes. And finally, this is not always, we cannot always do this, but try to limit email to normal office or work hours. And this might be a agreement that you need to come to with your team. When are we expected to email? When are you going to email? Maybe you start with you. Like I am going to shut down email when I sit down to watch the evening news. And I will be back on email the next morning. Right? So figure that figure out what really works. Figure out what really works. Now to go along with that, if it's an emergency, critical, you must see now, how are you all going to communicate? By the way, critical, must see now is not email. Not. So what is it? Is it a phone call? Is it a text message? Is it some other tool? Set that up. Like, I'm going to be off email for this weekend or for this mythical vacation. If you really need to get in contact with me, and these are the reasons why you, why you would call me or contact me, this is how you do it. Right. So, you know, setting some, some rules around your downtime or normal office hours and then stating in an emergency, this is what, this is what you should do. Or in an emergency, this is what we all do. Some of you may have emergency procedures for your office, for your workplace. You know, how you contact each other should be in there. Finally, some good email hygiene. Uh, limit the time you spend on email. We talked last time about setting a timer. Once you get sucked into email in the morning, you're going to stay there unless something draws you away. So set a timer. Maybe you spend 20 minutes on email and then you go do something else, right? Uh, but limit the time you spend on email. Also, you might limit the time you spend on other tools too. Delete messages that you do not need to keep. Delete. Delete them when they come in <laughs> and you've read them. Someone says, um, you know, beautiful day out, see you at lunchtime, delete. Uh, email message from a, an email list that's just informational and you don't need the information, delete. So try to delete messages that you don't need when you're reading them. Uh, if you can't do it then, then spend time every week, if not every day, deleting messages and looking and saying, oh, I need to delete that. I don't need that anymore. That cleans out your email, makes you focus better on your email. Um, again, this is something you can do in other tools too, like text messaging. You can delete old text messages and that might be helpful to you. Only answer emails that need to be answered, right? Is there a question being asked at you? Then answer it. Is there some information you need to provide? Then answer it. But if you don't need to answer, then don't. Also think about who you need to answer. Do you need to answer everyone or just the person who sent it? Me Too emails are um, uh, 
you know, end the end of the day on next Wednesday, you know, have a great Thanksgiving. And then everyone says, oh, you too, you too. Have a great Thanksgiving. You too, you too. Uh, there's got to be a better way. Uh, so don't send, try not to send those kind of me too, where everyone's just chiming in, kind of echoing that first email. It just junks up everyone's email. You don't need that. In my old workplace, you know, if someone got an award, got a paper published, whatever it might be, there would be an announcement and then everyone would uh, send congratulations for that person to the entire email list and junk up everyone's email. Better, by the way, if they had just sent that congratulations to the person who needed to be congratulated. Not everyone needs to know that you congratulated them. Use folders. So clean out your inbox. One way of cleaning out your inbox, making it things that you should be focusing on, is to use folders. There are tutorials on using folders. There's methodology about thinking about using folders. Uh, it can be projects. It can be um, activities. It can be you know, what, whatever. Organizations, maybe specific organizations that you're dealing with are folder names. But create folders, use folders. Uh, that makes it easy to find information about that project. Also, uh, there may be something that you look at and go, oh, you know, I created a folder for story time ideas that I've received. And now it's a year later and, and everything in that folder is old and I don't need it. I can just delete the folder, which helps you clean out your email. Go through your send emails also uh, and place them in folders. So um, this is harder to remember to do, but it's helpful. If you have projects and you're sending and receiving emails, put those received emails in folders, but also look for those sent emails and put them in the, in the, the correct folders also. Periodically clean out your, in, your inbox. So a tip I gave last time, and I think at least one person tried it, is to create a new folder like old inbox and put all of those emails, those older inbox emails in that folder. Just copy them right over. Now, um, this is good. There might be something older that you're looking for. You can go to that folder and look, look for it while keeping your inbox shorter focused. Also, in the future, whenever that future is, you can go and delete that old inbox folder. Have you looked at it? Was it necessary? No. Now, I'll admit that there's been times when I've had multiple old inbox folders, old inbox one, old inbox 2019, old inbox 2020. Um, but it's an effort to like just rapidly clean out my inbox and make it more focused. Um, also, periodically clean out your sent messages. Sort it uh, by different ways. That's a tip. Sort it by who you sent it to, sort it by subject, sort it by date. Just see if you can like, do some bulk deleting to try to narrow that down a bit. Uh, because it's probably very unwieldy. Again, if you want to move some older sent messages into an old sent folder, that can be helpful. And here are some email resources. Uh, you'll have these uh, in the handout. They'll be, they should be clickable uh, in the PDF. So people who have written about doing effective emails, um, First three are text-based uh, resources. The fourth one is Getting Things Done podcast. They have a specific episode on best practices of email communication. Um, by the way, if you're interested in 
um, methodology around getting things done, <laughs> organizing yourself to get things done. Uh, David Allen wrote the book, Getting Things Done. Uh, he has a podcast, he has other things that you can do for free, right? So uh, that's a specific podcast on email communication. So let me uh, talk about getting, using some other tools well also. I recognize that the email stuff can work for other tools, but um, let's just think about uh, a few other things. So uh, in your other tools, again, we're a very email culture, but you are using other tools. What is that tool intended for? If you're using text messaging with people at work, why? What, what do you intend that text messaging to be used for? If you're using another tool, um, I continue to pick on Slack. That's not an endorsement, it's just what comes to mind. What are you using that tool for? So think about their intention. Have you agreed on when and how to use it? If your team has not agreed, you can start that conversation especially if you think it's gotten unwieldy or out of hand. Are people text messaging you all the time and not really about work? So get some agreement on when and how to use. Tools like Slack and many other tools that are more text-based but will keep a history, a better organized history than text messaging on your phone, um, you can create folders or groups that can also be helpful. And again, you'd want to set some rules around that. Does everyone have the correct technology to use those tools? Sorry, it should say use and not us. Does everyone have the correct technology to use those tools? Use. If you're expecting people to text message for work, do they have that capability on their phone? Do they have the minutes on their phone to use for work? Um, if, if you're using another tool um, that is app-based, do they have it on their phone? Do they have the bandwidth to use it on their phone? Or maybe it's an app they can use on their computer do they have the right technology? And these days, technology also comes with um, minutes, if it's a phone-based thing. So do they have the technology and do they have the minutes, the bandwidth to actually use it? Are people using these technologies correctly? Have you assumed? <laughs> that they're using it correctly. In these other tools, as in email, can you make humor and questions obvious? Obvious. This will be painful. I will tell you that. To make questions obvious is sometimes painful because you have to change how you're thinking because you want to be understood. So when you're sending out something and you have a question in mind, make it obvious, whether that's on email, text messaging, or in some other app. If you're trying to be humorous, no matter where you're being humorous, make it obvious. You know, even if you just put in the word humor or, you know, something. Because the body language and your voice are not there. And using these other technologies, is it really accessible for all, for all people? So that's something that we need to increasingly think about is accessibility. Not only in email and Zoom and other places, but in text messaging, in those other tools that we're using. Now, you might say, Jill, everyone in our group, 
can use those tools just fine. We don't have to think about accessibility. Um, that might be an assumption that you need to test. That's also an assumption about your current group, not people who might um, join in the future. So thinking about accessibility now when it's not a huge issue could be beneficial for when you have to think about it in the future when it really is an issue. It really is an issue. And again, there may be people right now on your work team who have some accessibility issues and they haven't told you. So make sure that they can use the tools, that they're accessible. If they need to increase the font size or whatever it is that makes it better for them, make sure that they understand how to do that. Also might make it better for you. Um, captioning in Zoom and in other um, video tools is increasingly important and we should just be doing so uh, think about how you can do that. Also think about uh, the use of screen readers. Are the tools compatible with screen readers? You may not know that. So uh, that might be something to investigate, uh, especially investigate when you get other people on your team or in your webinars or in your whatever um, who do have accessibility issues. I've been learning more uh, about captioning in the last couple of weeks, and I can tell you that there are for recorded content, video content, ways of doing captioning. Um, it does take time, um, but this is something we need to learn. This is something that we need to get more comfortable with. Okay. So let's talk about changing your workplace communication culture and getting ready for that conversation. Um, and then I'm gonna break after this. So it's gonna be uh, two more slides. Look at the chat um, and then talk about whether or not we're gonna do a breakout session before we really uh, talk about some training things. So you should, have some notes from this webinar. And you might have notes from the previous webinar if you're there last week or from watching the recording, or you will have notes from watching the recording in the future. So you have some notes. What's going well? What is going well? Think about your communication with your team with those around you, with family, with friends. We can really extend this out. Uh, Mary Carol asked in chat about your, your partners, your partner organizations. What's going well? Are the messages timely? Are they worded in a way that makes sense to you? Are people using the subject headings or whatever it might be? What's going well? Do they contain what's necessary? Or are you having to like go back and forth because people haven't told you what you really need to know? If you're going back and forth because people haven't told you what you really need to know, then there's something wrong, something that could be fixed. Are you getting good use out of the tools? whatever good use means. And then think about, can you provide some specific examples or some specific benefits of using the tools that you're using? So if you're saying to people, hey, let's you know, use uh, this one app for more timely communications. Let's not rely on email so much. Let's use this one app. Talk about the benefits. Be ready with some examples and some benefits. Maybe you want to try that app as a trial for a while. Fine, do that. And then get together with the other people to say, what are the benefits? Are we communicating more timely? Um, are we getting things done faster? What is it? 
Now, in terms of um, your external communicate, your uh, external people, partners, whatever they might be, recognize that you can bring them in on some of those apps too. And you can say to them, you know, we're going to use this app for this project, for example. And you only need to use it with us for this one project. You know, please check once a day. You know, I suspect that many people would be willing to do that, especially if they realize that, you know, using another tool would lessen the emails that they receive. Where have there been, where have there been problems? So what's going well? What's going well? It's hard to talk about what's going well without slipping right over into where there have been problems. But try to think about what's going well. Where have there been problems? Where have your communications failed? What was the failure? Did a water, water main break and it took three days before someone told you? You were on vacation and no one decided to, you know, f communicate with you. Um, so what's the example of where something has failed? And given what you know now, what could have been done differently around those failures where something has gone wrong, where the communication took too long? or where you didn't recognize that you were being asked a question. What could have been done differently? And think about how that change would help your team. How would it help you? How would it help your team? And again, it's hard to talk about you communicating with also talking about everyone else communicating with you. So I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to look at the chat. There's been a lot of good conversation and tips in there. <laughs> Might be hard to catch up. Yeah, you know, when you're presenting, you get a count of the number of messages in chat. And so I know that there's been like, you know, since the last time I broke about 30 messages. Um, yeah, I can summarize a bit the um, go right ahead. Okay, <laughs> going back a bit, um, the conversation about um, management and communications, there were some people that are supervisors in the chat saying they are open to feedback. So I thought that was nice to hear. Um, there was a good conversation about should a longer email become a document when that might work when it might not work. That's a good one. Yes. Yeah, not perfect for all situations, but a suggest that was a suggestion. Um, people talked about proofreading emails before they go out. And there had been a question earlier about in-person communications um, directed towards you. This person felt that their in-person communications were very rushed and noted that you are not a rushed communicator. And did you have any tips on kind of not rushing communications in person? Um, so thank you for saying that I'm not a rushed communicator. Sometimes I think I am. So I, so I, I will get to that. Um, oh, I think I've gone back too far. Someone though there's different levels of communication and, and Lisa, you're right. I think getting, understanding what those levels are and, um, having some agreement around them is important. And uh, uh, Jackie said she was on the Board of Education and was given a list of acronyms. That could be awesome, uh, especially if you're communicating with people externally to your work group, people, partners who may not understand all the library acronyms. So, you know, here's the acronyms that you're going to hear us say, we're really sorry, but we don't know how to stop ourselves from using these acronyms. So here's a list. 
Um, I like the idea of using a document instead of an email, although then that becomes a two-step process. You're going to send an email that links to a document. You could attach a document um, in the email, st still a two-step process. Um, but you're right, sometimes things get really long in email. Having a document that can be printed or that's better formatted can be helpful. And I think the question is, is when do you kind of go over to that as a method um, for, for being better, a better communicator? Um, so, Someone said they hate long text, they're hard to read. Um, and so, yeah, so uh, Susan says about you know, having an agreed upon way to be contacted in the emergency. Um, and, um, and that's important. Uh, I'm just gonna scroll down to the bottom. Uh, Heather talks about using uh, a policy and the outlook about how long a message should be kept. So Outlook does give you some great tools. They don't exist everywhere. So if you're using Google Mail or using something, some other tool besides Outlook, look at what's available to you uh, in terms of tools, in terms of the signals, in terms of how it will sort email and get comfortable with those and recognize that whatever those things are will work great for you now, but maybe next year you'll want to do something different and that's okay um, and then on captioning uh, I agree captioning is not perfect but it's better than nothing um, a tip I was given recently is to actually if if even if you don't need captioning to turn on captioning so you see how it looks and as a speaker to sometimes turn on captioning. Now, I haven't done that here. I did that a little bit last week. Um, but I had a meeting recently in Google Meet, which automatically does captioning. And I turned on captioning just to see what it looked like. It was an informal conversation. And so it was easy for me to pay attention and look down at the captioning every once in a while, just to see if it understood me. OK, so for face-to-face -face communication, For face-to-face -face communication, I'm laughing at Susan's about how many times you say, um, uh, captioning will definitely tell you that. Slow down, sometimes by gathering your thoughts will slow you down. So uh, as someone's talking to you and you're thinking about your reply, first of all, if you're thinking about your reply, you're not thinking, you're not listening to them. So it could be helpful to, you know, write notes on whatever scrap piece of paper is in front of you so that you're not interrupting them, but you're also remembering what you want to say. Just some key words can be helpful. It can be helpful to, to take a really good breath to slow you down. It can be helpful to think about... Um, Enunciation will slow you down. If you're thinking about being understood and enunciating, uh, that, that can help slow you down. Um, but I think just being mindful of your pace uh, will be good. The other thing that has moments, instances in my life that have slowed me down have been when I've worked with a translator. And so I've had opportunities to host visitors from other countries when I was on campus and they would come with a translator. And when you deal with a translator, you have to occasionally stop <laughs> to let that translator catch up. And so that was really helpful to recognize that. If you have people that you're working with who come from other cultures, they're translating often in their heads as you're talking. And so pausing to let them catch up can be helpful. If you deal with someone who's translating with American Sign Language, again, a translator 
pausing at the end of a sentence, even briefly, allows that person to catch up. So, um, so, so not one thing. Um, so fast talkers, as Lisa said, I'm actually was I'm a native fast talker. I don't fast talk anymore. I've lived in this in New York State um, for too long. But when I talk to my best friend, we fast talk. So a fast talker will always be a fast talker in certain situations. The thing is, is to figure out when you should not be a fast talker and, and find ways of slowing yourself down. Uh, and Jessica says that slowing down helps with co closed captioning as well. So you're not outrunning the closed captioning. It can hear you, it can catch up. Okay. So I'm gonna, um, So not going to be able to do the breakout. Um, but if we had been able to do a breakout, what you would have done as, a, as small groups is to think about what's going well, what needs to be changed, and do a little rehearsing for that conversation with your group. If you're the boss, and some of you on here are in charge of your organizations, really think deeply about that conversation because you don't want to come off as being as accusing people of doing something wrong. You want to be open for suggestions. And so, you know, how do you do that conversation about what's going well in communications where you could improve without make without making people feel guilty. If you are not the boss, maybe what you need to uh, do is to get with your co-workers, a few, and think about what's going well, what needs to change, and think about how you want to approach the rest of the group. Maybe you want to approach people one by one, informally, before you bring it up in a group meeting. Maybe you want to make some changes before you bring it up in a group meeting. So anyway, do some thinking about that, do some practicing, some practice, you know, how you want that, that uh, conversation to go. Often change needs training. And so this is what we're gonna wrap up on. Do people actually know how to use the tool, right? Do they know? So I've, I've um, mentioned Slack last week and this week. Um, when someone on my team came to me and said, well, we could use Slack for these instant communications and not use email. And we moved 95% of our communication to Slack. I didn't understand Slack. And so I had to do some training, some learning about what Slack is. I was late to that game, right? So do people actually understand how to use those tools? Do you need to do some training? Um, maybe there's previous training that needs to be reinforced. Maybe um, you can do training or can you do training in a way that doesn't cause blame or shame? So no wagging the finger, like you did it wrong. Can you, can you do training in some sort of informal way that doesn't make people feel bad about what they've been doing? So your training options are YouTube videos. Trust me, they're out there for everything. Webinars. Webinars might be overkill. A webinar on text messaging? No. 
maybe some documentation. Many of the tools, the apps that we're using now for work have documentation. Some of that documentation sucks, but it's a place to start. So look for documentation. Look for other people's documentation, right? So people who are using these tools sometimes create their own documentation and put it on the internet. So don't just look for the official documentation. Look at Lifehacker or other places for what they've said about those tools. Maybe you need some one-on-one. -on -one. Maybe you need someone to show you how to use that tool. How do you do that thing? Show me. Or maybe you've learned something that you want to tell other people. Maybe during a staff meeting, you say, hey, look what I discovered. You know, I discovered I can do this thing. Maybe make it a show and tell. Some of these tools have some great extra features in them. And I'll, I'll just, you know, say one more positive about Slack. Uh, and by the way, Slack is not the, o the only communication app I use. Um, but a lot of people do use Slack. I discovered I could set reminders in Slack for myself. And it would remind me. Imagine being out someplace and needing to remind myself that tomorrow, and usually it was tomorrow, I needed to call somebody or I need to send an email or I need to do blah, blah, blah. I could set a reminder in Slack. And if I was on my phone, I could actually talk to Slack and have it do it. So some great features in these tools that we may not be using. You may not need those extra features and that's fine, but maybe those extra features would get people committed to the tool and ready to use it, willing to use it. Okay, so training. Um, you know, we assume everyone knows how to use email. I can guarantee you that not everyone that you're dealing with understands everything about email. I had a conversation with some, someone recently who did not understand BCC and some positives of using BCC. Uh, so training can be important. Just quick show and tells, whatever it might be, but if you're doing it, do it in a way that does not make people feel um, like the finger is being pointed at them, that they did something wrong. So last um, questions, I think. I think we're uh, almost at time, 1128 on the stove. So uh, are there remaining questions that people have or amazing, uh, <laughs> remaining comments that you want to make in chat? What has gone well? What are you thinking about? Uh, what do you want to change? Whatever it might be, this is a great time to just pop those in. So Jackie says, you know, in terms of using the tools, why aren't we surprised that, you know, there are things that we're using that we don't understand? And we should not be surprised. Um, but there's this assumption that everyone understands everything, that you will figure it out. And we all don't have the time to figure everything out. So spending a little bit of time learning for yourself or learning together can be really useful. Yeah, we're in the midst of such a huge communications shift right now. So we definitely need to be patient with people. Yep. So Jessica, anything from you? Anything that? I will just pop back in to thank you, Jill. And thanks to everybody for participating today. There have been some really good uh, tips and conversations in the chat. And I'd just like to invite you all to our next webinar, which is on Monday, December 14th at 11 a.m. It's on library services for indigenous people from land acknowledgement to outreach. Um, and Jill is also doing a working session coming up on Thursday, December 10th at 10 a.m. on SMART goals through our sister council, CLRC. 
So I'll send links to both of those when I send the follow up email to this. I'll send you all the recording as well as the slides. Jessica, I want to thank you and everyone else for um, being involved in, in the session. Uh, for those of you who were involved in the session last time too, thank you. Um, watch the videos. Uh, there's a lot kind of packed in here. And as I've said, they do overlap. So if you think, well, she didn't say that in this session, go back to the first session. It might actually be there. Yeah, I'll send out links to everything for that. So <laughs> have a great day, everybody. Thank you. Bye.